All right. Good morning, everybody. I am Kathleen Jasper, and we are doing Praxis 5205 and 5206, and that is the teaching reading exam for Praxis, but this will help you with any teaching reading exam. So welcome everyone. Come on into the room. If you have signed up for this webinar on our website, you should have received a link to join and a free study guide. And if you're in the chat, I can see Cindy, Merlene, Ruth, you guys are all here. Good morning. Good morning. As you come into the room, just let us know that you can hear me and see me. It looks like everybody can hear and see me. And if you're following us on Facebook or on YouTube, there is a link in the description to get the resources that go with this webinar. So this webinar is for the Praxis Teaching Reading Exam and either the 5205, which is elementary education, or the 5206, which is K through 12. We're going to cover both. And with this webinar comes a free study guide that you got to download and some other resources. After this webinar is over, I'm going to send you an email with everything we talk about today. So let's say you couldn't download the study guide in time or you're having trouble finding it or whatever. Don't worry, just follow along with me. I'm going to project everything on my screen so you can see everything we're supposed to do. And you won't have to worry about, you know, fumbling through things and trying to um, figure out what's going on with everything. That's just, you don't need to do all that. Okay. So just let me know if you can hear and see me. Looks like people are in. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the study guide. You guys are from Maryland, New Hampshire. Let me know where you guys are from. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, me for a second so that we can uh, talk about why I'm here and what my credentials are for uh, helping you guys today. So my name is Kathleen Jasper, if you don't already know, if you're new here. And I, for the last 10 years, have been helping people pass their teacher certification exams and their leadership certification exams. So I was a reading teacher. So this, this content area that we're doing today is kind of my jam. Um, I also was a curriculum specialist downtown in the district office. And then I became an assistant principal at a high school. I've always taught at the high school level, but I have participated in a lot of teaching at the elementary and middle level as well. So I have some experience there. Um, as an assistant principal, I learned a lot as well about curriculum. My job downtown in the curriculum department is where I got the understanding of assessments, especially large scale standardized assessments administered by large testing companies like the ones you guys are taking for this exam. And I share that knowledge with you guys. So I do see we've got some uh, ten people from Tennessee, New Orleans, Texas, Lisa from Texas, and Ms. Walker from Texas. Listen, if you're taking the STR in Texas, this is going to help you. It's virtually the same exam. They all assess the same thing. So it might be in a different order. It might have a different name, but the skills of teaching reading are the same across the country. Your state just might use a different test, all right? Indiana, Tennessee, West Virginia. Wow. Maryland. Awesome guys. Virginia, New Jersey. We always have a lot from New Jersey, New Mexico, Pennsylvania. Oh my gosh. We've got people from everywhere. I'm so glad you guys are here today. All right. So here's how it's going to go today. I'm going to start off showing you some resources that you can get additionally from the free stuff you're going to see today. You can simply use our free stuff and pass. Lots of people do, but we also have additional resources and I have some new stuff you guys might be interested in. Then we're going to jump in to the free study guide and I'm going to work through those questions, discussing some of the overarching elements and things you're going to see on the exam, especially especially structure and the way these tests are kind of designed because there is a pattern and I always try to find the patterns. Okay. Um, then we are going to do two constructed response questions because I have people in here for elementary and I have people in here for K through 12. So I'm going to do an elementary example and I'm going to do a ninth grade example. That way we get the whole gamut of what you need. Now, even if you're elementary, stay for the high school example. And even if you're high school, pay attention to the elementary example because it's all the same. People get hung up on grade levels, but this is about teaching reading and it doesn't matter. Um, the name of your test doesn't matter. Matter. The grade level doesn't matter. The concepts about the science of teaching reading is the same across 
countries, across uh, states, and across tests. So we're going to cover that all here, all right? So it looks like everybody is uh, doing great. Derek says the 5205 book is very helpful. Got it off Amazon. Awesome. So glad you guys like it. We have a lot of publications. Let me show you a couple, uh, the, thi the thing that came with this webinar, which is the free study guide. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Now, this is the free study guide that you got with the uh, webinar when you signed up. Now, if you're watching me on social media, you can get this. Just click the link in the description. It'll take you to the um, the sign up form. You sign up, takes you to a thank you page, and you can immediately download this and access the link to the live webinar if you want to get into the chat. But this is what it looks like. This is an abbreviated version. This is only a few pages, right? So I've got some practice test questions here that cover all the different content categories, about 15. Very detailed answer explanations. Please read the answer explanations, even if you got it correct. It's important to do that on any of our books. And then I've got um, one constructed response here. Now I'm going to do two today. I'm going to send you both those constructed responses in the follow-up email. So, and if you're watching this in the future, hello future people, you already got it in your email. But if you're watching this live, which is right now 10.05 on Saturday, April 13th, you're going to get the second constructed response I do today in an email. So don't worry about that. Now beyond this, we have the actual study guide, the big study guide, which is, um, let's see here, it's like 200 or 181 pages. Okay. So we, we break everything up by content category and everything is aligned to the test specifications. I told you I worked in curriculum downtown. I learned all about test specs. And it's important to use the test specs to align our products. So you can see here, this is the first content category, and I've got everything that's important about that. And there's a lot that I can't even begin to cover today. And then I have 10 questions just for that content category. So you can see what those look like and then very detailed answer explanations. All right. Then the same thing goes for all the other content categories. So I do the same thing with phonics and decoding, vocabulary, comprehension. Then with assessment, I have a constructed response, but first I take you through all the different types of reading assessments. This is important. You're going to have to access these assessments on the constructed response. They might ask you which two assessments should you use. We're going to talk about it today, but there's a lot. You know, here's a um, fluency assessment here. You in this book, you're going to get all of the different types of assessments. And then I have, sorry to make you dizzy. Oh my God, let me let me go over here. I hate that. Okay. Then I have 20 assessment questions because assessment is so important in the teaching reading classroom because we have to assess where our students are in order to intervene and all of that. So there's 20 questions here. And then I have multiple constructed responses for you to use. So you get that understanding of assessment, then you can apply it to the constructed response. We're going to talk about it today, but this is a much more comprehensive um, study guide. And so I want you to know you get the free one and this one's great. And some of you only need the free, but then we have the actual study guide for sale on our website. Now, let me show you where I got that. So let me go ahead and share screen one more time and then we'll get started because I want you to know where you can get um, the, this information. So this is my website, KathleenJasper.com. You are going to get an offer code today. You probably already got it in your email. You're going to get an offer code to purchase things on our website. It will work on anything, right? So the first thing I want you to see is that we have a study guide for the teaching reading, but for both the 5205 and the 5206. So here's the teaching reading study guide. People are saying in the chat, it's very helpful. And it is. It's got a lot of five-star reviews and it's great. Now, we also have this new audio course here. I'm really excited about the audio course. I've been building audio courses for all of our stuff. I hope to have more. In fact, I just finished one for special ed. The book plus the audio course is a great way to get all the information. A lot of people you know, listen to the audio course in their car on their way to school or when they're vacuuming or when they're walking their dog. And then they look in the study guide for the practice test and, and they read the information. Great combination. And if you bundle them together, you can save. Now, beyond that, we also have an online course, which is really helpful. This has videos. So if you like what I'm doing today and you want more of this kind of thing, this course is for you. Now, this comes with the study guide. You do not have to buy the study guide when you buy the online course. It comes with that. So make sure you don't buy the study guide and the online course. They both come together. But we also have an audio course for my auditory learners. 
So you can see here, this is for our people who I'm an audi auditory learner. I love to ride in the car, listen to podcasts. This is a great way to get that information. Now, if you also want to, um, let me go here to study guides. If you want a physical book, okay, go to Amazon here, click this button on Amazon. It'll take you to a physical book. Don't buy this and print it. It's too much money. Just go to Amazon and we'll click here. You can see we have a ton of five-star ratings for this book. Lots of people love this book. And it'll come to you via Prime in a couple of days. I highly recommend you do this rather than buy it digitally and print it out. I mean, unless you have unlimited ink and paper and patience, uh, I would just buy the physical study guide here. Now, um, let's go back to here. We are going to give you an offer code for our website to buy the stuff on our website today after the webinar is over. And I believe Yana is in the chat. She'll probably give it to you in the chat right now if you want to get it now. But I can't give offer codes on Amazon because that's the publisher. They're the ones distributing the book. They don't allow us to do offer codes on our books. So if you want the physical book, you have to pay full price. It's not that big of a deal. But if you want the discount, you use our site here and you'll be able to get the discount there. All right. So that's just a quick review of some of the things we offer on top of what I'm going to do today. I'm also going to show you at the end of this where to get more free resources. I'm going to show you my YouTube channel and specific playlists. I'm also going to link all of this up in the um, email you're going to get after this webinar is over. All right. Now, I don't like to spend too much time on that. I do like to let you know where you can get stuff, but now I want to get into the actual instruction. So teaching reading is my jam. I taught reading for many, many years. And when I say it's my jam, I don't mean like I'm the best in the world at it. I just know a lot about this exam and I know a lot about the skills and all the words you need to know and all of that in order to be successful on this test. Okay. So I'm going to use terms like good words, bad words. When you hear me say good words, that means be on the lookout for those in the answer choices. And those are the words that are aligned to the test specifications and the standards that this test is aligned to. So every test has a spec. Every test delivered by a giant testing company like this has a spec. If you want to read the specs, and I really encourage you to do that, all you have to do is Google your test name and the word study companion if it's a praxis exam. If it's not a praxis exam, like for Texas people and things like that, you can just do test specification or test blueprint. So the name of your exam and test blueprint. You might have to click around a little bit. For the praxis exams, it's a PDF. You'll see the little PDF in the link and it's given from the ETS website. That's Education Testing Services. That's the company that makes this exam. You're going to see my website on that page. You're going to see other people's website. We're trying to sell you things. Don't do that. Go to the actual PDF of this test, download it, and read it. You don't have to memorize it, but in that spec, you're going to see all the skills you're responsible for. There's going to be a bunch of language in there, like differentiated instruction, scaffolding instruction, helping struggling learners, systematic instruction. These are all good words you're going to see in the correct answer choices on the exam. The testing company builds a blueprint and a spec, the specifics to show you what is on the test. It's a very transparent process. So they're not trying to hide anything from you. I know a lot of people feel tricked and deceived and all that. There is a document that outlines it all. And anything on that document is called fair game. They can test you anything. Now, does that mean you're going to get the exact same questions that are in my book and the exact same questions that are on the test specs on your exam? No. I have no idea what questions you're going to get. This can be assessed in many different ways. But if you understand those specifications, if you understand the skills, if you really get to know the information, then you will do well in the test. If you just do practice tests over and over again and memorize questions, you're going to have a hard time passing because you're probably not going to get those same exact questions and answer choices on the exam. So it can throw you off if you try to memorize too much. So get to know the information, get to know the skills. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. Okay. Now, if you're taking a Pearson exam, that's who builds the Texas exams. Just Google your test name and the word test blueprint, test specification. Theirs are not in a PDF. Theirs are outlined on their websites. It's very kind of clunky. It's not a really fun website to use, 
but you will find these standards that are listed and has all the language and all the good words in it. Now, I used to project that on my screen until I learned that that is a copyright violation. And so I don't want to project their documents, even though they're free, you can get them for free. You do not have to pay for them during my webinars because it is their intellectual property. And so I don't project them anymore on my screen, but you can find them if you just Google the test name and the word test specs, study companion, blueprint, those are the words that they use for these documents. Very, very important, okay? All right, so Yana's got the offer code in the uh, chat here, very good. I already have the book, is it possible to buy the audio course by itself? The audio course is by itself. Here's what we can do for the uh, online course. If you want the video course, you can send us proof of purchase from your uh, physical book or your book that you bought on our website, the digital book, and we will apply that to the cost of the online video course. The audio course does not come with the book. The audio course is just the audio course. So if you bought the audio course, Meredith, I believe you're asking this, you can just add the audio course, but don't forget the offer code for 20% off um, and just, here, let me show you. I know what you're thinking because they look bundled together. Good, good question. Thank you. Uh, let me just show you. Meredith was asking, can we just get the audio course? Because right here, you can see they're linked together as a bundle. You can just take this off and then you have the audio course here, or you can go to this tab here under audio courses and you can click that and it's here. Now you can uncheck just uncheck the bundle here and you can just buy the audio course. And then when you go to checkout, add that offer code that Yana has put in the chat. And you'll also get that offer code in the um, email at the end of this. Okay. All right. I'm so glad you guys are all here. Perfect. All right. Let's get started now. Let's go to my actual presentation. Now it's really important that we understand the science of teaching reading. And this is going to be an explicit and systematic process. Now, explicit, systematic, and recursive are good words on this exam. So the 5205 and the 5206. Explicit means what I'm doing here with you today. I'm very, being very explicit in what I'm telling you. I'm telling you exactly what you need to know. I'm showing it on my screen. I'm going to go through all the steps here. That is explicit. You are sitting here watching me and I am giving you the information. Systematic is we go from skill up to the next skill, up to the next skill, up to the next skill. So for example, we start with phonological and phonemic awareness, which has to do with sounds, only in words. Now I'm going to do some writing because I need you to understand. But when we are in the classroom and we're doing phonological and phonemic awareness, we're only working with the sounds in words. I'm going to give you some examples in a minute, but going with that systematic instruction, then we might move to phonics. And this is when we decode words, a higher level skill than just the sounds like we did in this one. So now we move up a skill, right? Then we get into fluency. Then we get into vocabulary. Then we get into comprehension. Then we get into writing. That progression is systematic. We start here, the very beginning, and we move to progression of skills, okay? So that is systematic. So explicit means I'm being very clear in my communication. I'm modeling. I'm showing you how to do it. Look at me. I'm showing you, boys and girls, everybody look up here at me, right? We do that in the classroom. And then systematic is I'm building upon each skill in a step-by-step -step process. Now, recursive is when, let's say I'm here at phonics and I'm learning to decode words based on their letter sound correspondence. I might have to go back and strengthen some skills here. That's recursive, recurring, going back. You'll also see recursive instruction in the writing because we wanna emphasize revision and editing and writing. A piece of uh, writing is never done. We can always go back and be in a recursive mode, all right? So I want you to remember that. Explicit, systematic, and recursive instruction, good words on any teaching reading exam, if you see those words in the answer choice, for sure, it's the correct answer, for sure. Now, I would say 99.99999% of the time. All right, now let's go through some of these skills, the skill progression in the science of teaching reading. That's what this is. That's the name of the Texas exam, science of teaching reading assessment. 
Uh, it's called the teaching reading exam here, but there is a science and all of these skills should be taught explicitly and systematically. Now we start with the sounds only in words here. And I always like to use this umbrella. Think of phonological awareness as a bunch of skills together. These are sounds and words for bigger sections of the word. For example, in the word track. Now I'm writing it here. If I were doing this in the classroom, I wouldn't be writing it. You would be listening to me as students, but I need to break it up for you so you can see as teachers like what we're doing here, okay? Um, and remember, phonological and phonemic awareness can be done in the dark. You do not have to see the word to do phonological and phonemic awareness. But I'm writing it here for us to understand. So let's say I say, okay, boys and girls, or friends, or folks, or whatever you want to say. I want to make sure we're very inclusive. We are talking to our students. Okay, students. I want you to, to say the word track and the students say track and I say, say the word track and they say track and I say, say the word track and break it up by onset and rhyme. Now we've already practiced this. Remember all of this is systematic and, and practice. And so they go tur ack. That would be onset and rhyme. Well, the tur is the first consonant or consonant cluster. That's the onset. Ack is the rhyme, R-I-M-E. Yes, I spelled that correctly. And I go through this in the book. The rhyme is the vowel and consonants that follow. So in the word um, splat, the onset is spool. And the rhyme is at, that did not, that didn't, sorry, my handwriting. Let me try that again. In the word splat, we'll do it up here. The spool is the onset. At is the rhyme. So it's the beginning on uh, the beginning consonant or consonant cluster. Notice we have SPL as the consonant cluster. And it's broken up by then the uh, vowel and the ending consonant in that way. Now this is breaking up bigger chunks of the word. So that's phonological awareness. We might also use phonological awareness for syllables. Break up the break up the word apple. Apple. Okay. That's not by onset and rhyme, it's by syllables, but they're still using their sounds. They're not looking at the word. I'm writing it here for you, but they're just listening. So bigger chunks of the words with phonological awareness. Phonemic awareness is when they break up individual sounds. So this is with onset and rhyme here, but if I wanted you to um, break it up by by phonemic awareness, it would be individual sounds. So it would be s, p, o, a, t. Notice that's much more nuanced. Or t, r, a, k, because it makes the k sound. Okay? So that's different. Phonological awareness, bigger chunks of words. Uh, it still sounds only. Onset and rhyme, syllables, stuff like that. Phonemic awareness, individual sounds. Phonemic awareness is arguably more complex because they have to uh, break up the word very nuanced and by individual sounds. So make sure you understand that for the test. Now, once we've done all that and if you go on TikTok, there's a bunch of teachers who do some really cool phonological and phonemic awareness games. Um, there was one where a teacher was like, all right, say the word tree. And they say tree. And they say, say the word tree. And she says, delete the t sound. And they go, re. Notice that they're deleting sounds. They're manipulating words. That's a high level of phonemic or phonological awareness when you are manipulating sounds and words. There's all kinds of ways in which we do this because we want students to understand sounds and words before we move on to phonics, which is when we decode words that we see with our eyes. Let me draw an eye here. It's a very bad eye, but that's an eye, right? We have to look at it. And the reason why is, look at these words here, cat, cut, caught, and cable, all make a k sound, right? Because the C is followed by an A, U, O, or K, U, 
uh, or an I if the C is followed by, no, nope, not if the C is followed by an I. Sorry, A, U, and O, it's going to make a K sound. If the C is followed by an E, I, or Y, it makes a S sound. Well, we can't do that just by sounds. I have to look at the word and see that the word sell, cycle, receive, and city are all followed by an E, I, or Y. So the C does not make a K sound. It makes a S sound. Notice this is much more complex. I have to distinguish between different spelling patterns, different codes in words. The P and the H together isn't a P sound. It's a F sound, right? These are all codes within the words, and we have to understand this to have phonics. It's a step up from phonological and phonemic awareness. Notice we're doing this in an explicit and systematic way. Reading is systematic. We need these skills before we can start reading paragraphs and sentences. We have to be able to decode words. All right, let's get into some questions. Now, this is number two on your free study guide. Sorry, I'm a little parched today. This is number two on the free study guide. If you can follow along, follow along. If not, don't, uh, don't worry about it. Just watch my screen and you can go back to it later, okay? Just like in your classes. Don't worry about the paper. Look at me, look at me, right? We always say that to students. So don't, don't fumble around with your free study guide. You'll get to it. Just look here. I'd rather you get the instruction first. All right, so what I like to do is... Start with the answer choices first. Those of you who have been in my webinars, you know I do this because I like to eliminate any bad words or zero in on good words. So I have identifying the beginning sounds in words, clapping syllables, identifying the ending sounds in words, and deleting sounds in words. Okay, can't do much there. Now, I know a lot about reading. Um, and so I would start thinking like, okay, uh, identifying identifying, and then we have this deleting. This is more complex because this is manipulating sounds. A and C are kind of the same. Uh, B and D might be a little more complex. I'm just thinking about my answer choices here. Two, which of the following would not be a systematic instructional strategy used in phonemic awareness? Remember, phonemic awareness is identifying individual sounds in words, which could be the beginning sounds, it could be the ending sounds, and we could be identifying and deleting sounds in words. But what we wouldn't be doing is clapping syllables. This is more of a phonological awareness. That's more of a phonological awareness right here. The top, phonemic is individual sounds, much more nuanced, okay? So you have to know, you're going to get questions like this. You have to know the, the small differences between phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. I have a lot of videos on this. I cover it very extensively in the online course and in the audio course. Um, so you're going to get it here today. You're, you can get it in my paid stuff, but you can also go to my YouTube channel and I got all kinds of reading videos on there where I talk explicitly about this as well. All right. This is number four on your free study guide. Let's have a look. And I might answer choices here. Work on silent letters. Identify our controlled vowel sounds. Blend long vowel sounds with consonants. Identify common vowel combinations. All right. These are all skills. Can't eliminate anything there. It all looks good. Four, students have mastered consonant sounds, and short vowel sounds. Okay, which of the following would be the most appropriate next step in the teaching sequence? This is another systematic instruction question. We're asking what the next step is. So here's how it kind of goes with students and how they, they learn about consonants and vowels. Typically, okay, not everything is perfectly linear, but I like, this is just like typically what happens. Students hear the hard consonant sounds in, in words first. So exam for example, in the word sun, the students hear the s and the n first. They'll be able to identify those first. The medial sounds or the middle vowel sounds come next. And that's just kind of how our brains work. Now, is every child that way? Does it happen that way every single time? No, but for the most part, the research shows that that is how it goes. So right now, the student has 
uh, the hard consonants and maybe some medial vowel sounds. Short, not long. Long vowels are a whole other ball game. Short vowels come before long vowels, right? For example, in the word, you're going to understand the word pig before you understand the word make where this A is long and this E is silent. Notice it's a much more complex phonics skill, okay? So we've got words like pig, sun, bat, stuff like that. So what is the next step? Well, what we wanna do now is blend long vowel sounds with consonants. Silent letters is too, uh, too complex. That's way later. Our controlled vowels, those are words like letter. Um, uh, utter, other, those are more complex um, and, and multi-syllable words. So we're going to cross off B. Blending long vowel sounds with consonants, we have this consonant again, even if you didn't know the, um, the next step, you could kind of say, well, they've got consonant sounds here. Now, maybe the next step is to blend something with the consonants, right? So C is going to be the correct answer here. Identify common vowel combinations. This is a little more complex than blending long vowel sounds. Vowel combinations are things like E-A, um, I-E, O-U. This is complex. This has to do with diphthongs, vowel teams. This is a more complex phonic skill. Now, in the book, I have a table that outlines all the skills and the progression, so you'll be able to do that. But just kind of think here. Silent letters like... Um, uh, Night, N-I-G-H-T, that's a complex word, right? They're not going to go from sun to night. They're not going to go to from sun to, oh, God, now I can't think of any. Uh, uh, Naw, right? G in the end. That's, those come later, right? And R controlled are things like this, a little bit bigger. Now we, we went from short to long, which is kind of a natural progression, and we're attaching that to consonants, which we've already mastered. So there's usually clues in here. They know you're, you don't have a master's in teaching reading, but you have to kind of work through it and, and be on the lookout for those, those uh, clues. Read into it. Think about it, okay? Let's have a look at number 11. All right, now we're focusing a little bit more on um, fluency and reading, okay? Now, you might see a question like this on the test and go, oh, it's so long. Like, I hate questions like this. Okay, this is why starting with the answer choices and looking for good words and bad words will help you um, identify and eliminate and get better at this, okay? So I like to work backward and I like to find the good words and the answer choices and eliminate bad words. Let's start with A. The teacher should have the student focus on spelling because spelling is phonics and phonics is a necessary part of the comprehension process. Okay, phonics is spelling. We're learning to spell when we do phonics, and it is a necessary part of the comprehension process. I'm going to keep it. Uh, you're jumping ahead a little here. Spelling to comprehension is a little jump. We still need the fluency. We still need the vocabulary, but I don't hate A. I'm going to leave it. B, the teacher should have the student take a diagnostic assessment or diagnostic test. Ooh, I love assessments. And then have the reading coach work with the student eh, right away. We don't rely on the reading coach. Do we have amazing reading coaches in our schools? Yes, indeed. But on this test, you need to differentiate for your students. So we're not relying on the reading coach right away. I'm crossing that off. You'll see that on the test, okay? Don't do it. C, the teacher should use a running record to record the miscues a student demonstrates during a one minute of reading. All right, that's a fluency read. It's okay. D, the teacher should focus on fluency and automaticity strategies for the student because proper fluency and automaticity will reduce the cognitive demand needed for decoding, leaving more cognitive space for comprehension. Ding, ding, ding. This has all the good words in it. So even if I put a period after cognitive demand and didn't go into all this here, it would still be my best answer. First of all, automatic automaticity strategies do help with fluency. And when we have fluency, we reduce the cognitive energy we're using to decode words so that we can comprehend. We can build those pictures in our minds. Have you ever watched a student read a passage and the student is decoding every word, sounding out every word? It is so exhausting. And you almost feel for the student. You're like, oh my God, this kid is struggling. They're not comprehending. They're trying to decode every single little word. 
that's not working. So D is my my number one. A is still kind of in the running because spelling is phonics. This is true. Let's read the question. As a student is struggling during reading, the student often stops when encountering high frequency words and tries to decode them. This interrupts the reading and makes it difficult for the student to understand the meaning in text. Understand the meaning in text is comprehension. Which of the following interventions should the teacher employ? All right, the, the student is trying to decode high frequency words. We need to work on some fluency here. We need to work on some automatic skills. So that's rereading, rereading it again, reading it again, reading it again, over and over again, which helps to boost automaticity, accuracy, and confidence that the student needs to reduce cognitive demand. So we free up space in our brains so we can build those pictures, predict, think about the text, text as we are reading. D is the best answer here. All right, let's have a look at 12, reading the answer choices first. Encourage students to memorize portions of the text. Eh, no. We do memorize in reading sometimes. We memorize some of those sight words, and now I know a lot of the research is moving away from memorization. I get it. But we do do the sight word memorization. Some teachers are still doing it. I, I think it's fine, but don't come for me in the comments. Obviously, some people feel that we need to be thinking about the letter sound correspondence even within high frequency sight words. That's okay too. But I don't like memorizing portions of the text. That's too much. B, encourage students to ask questions. Ooh, the term ask questions is a comprehension strategy and a higher order critical thinking strategy. We always want to be moving students up, up, up to those higher order skills. This is when we talk about the Bloom's taxonomy. You'll see this a lot on the exam. Down here is identify, understand those basic skills. Moving up here, categorize, compare and contrast. And moving up here is our critical thinking. And generating questions is a critical thinking skill essential for comprehension. What do we do when we read? We go, I wonder why that happened. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen next. Huh? I wonder what happened in that person's life to make him or her act this way. Those questions we're asking in our mind make us critical thinkers and better readers and curious and all the things. Asking questions is a good word on the exam. I'm going to circle it. C, encourage students to partner read the text. Not bad, not as good as B. D, encourage students to read the text for homework. Typically, homework, bad word on the exam. Typically. Now, do we use homework in school? Yes, of course. However, if usually it's attached to a student struggling or a student who needs to improve a skill, and homework isn't necessarily going to do that. So I typically cross it off, all right? So let's have a look at the question. Which of the following would be most effective in developing students' comprehension of complex text. Asking questions would be most effective because asking questions goes directly with comprehension. Now, here's the thing. You might be a new teacher and you're going to get to some of these questions and you're going to go, well, all of these look good, or I can't decide between C and B, B and C. Because partner reading is good. My school uses partner reading. My school uses cooperative learning. My school uses homework. Of course, homework, but go home and read it and learn it. It says most effective. There's only one most effective strategy here, according to reading research, and that is asking questions. When you are thinking about these types of questions, think about the Bloom's taxonomy and what are we trying to do with students? We're trying to move them up that pyramid towards critical thinking and asking questions is essential in comprehension. So don't talk yourself out of the correct answer. Look for those higher order thinking skills, look for critical thinking, look for strategies that encourage comprehension. That's going to be the right answer. All right. This is number 14. I just, I know there's a lot of text on the page, but I kind of have to do this because it's test questions. And I wanted to use this one because it's big. And I know people get freaked out when they see a big question like this. All right. So let's have a look at the uh, answer choices first, especially on a big thing like this. Determining the author's point of view, identifying the literary devices used in the work, determining if whether the source is reliable. Good word when it comes to research skills. You're going to see this on upper elementary grades, because we start the research pro process early. And you're definitely going to see this on the 5206, because that's K through 12. And you are going to have some high school questions about research. Source reliability, source validity, source credibility, good words. 
determining the text structure. Right now, C is looking good. I'm going to continue to work backwards. I'm going to go here. Which of the following research skills is the teacher helping the students with? Okay. Now I'm going to go here. Checklist. Where did the information come from? Blog, academic journal, etc. Is there a list of references, a bibliography? Does the URL contain .gov, .edu, .net, or .com? Is the piece a primary source or secondary source? Don't worry, I'm going to go over all that in just a second. This is all about C, determining whether the source is reliable. Let's say why. Is it a blog? Blogs are good for information, but they usually are opinionated, and they can be written by anyone who has zero authority in the space. We know that. There are a lot of blogs out there with lot of things to say. And there's nothing wrong with that for getting some initial information. But where do we want to be? Academic journals, databases where there are studies, dissertations, things like that. Want to use a mix of that to fact check some of the stuff that's in the blog. Is there a list of references or a bibliography? If there is, it shows you that this author used other studies and other information to get the information, making it more reliable. Does the URL contain, got do, contain got dov, got dot .edu, dot .net, or .com? .com, typically not the uh, best. .edu, .gov, more reliable sources. Um, there's going to be more research on there. So it's just another way to kind of vet. Doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. Doesn't mean that every .edu and .gov site has perfectly accurate information, but it's definitely going to be better than a blog website. And then is this a primary source or secondary source? You're going to see this both on the elementary and the middle and high school portions of these exams. Primary source is straight from the person. So a speech, a letter, uh, a recording, something like that is a primary source. A secondary source is a piece that talks about the primary source. So for example, Dr. Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream speech is a primary source. He wrote it. It is the the origin. The secondary source might be the textbook talking about the speech or the um, academic journal that analyzed the speech. S still good information, but it's a secondary source. Using them together, always look for those answer choices where it says using primary and secondary sources together help to give us all the information we need. Now, look, I didn't even have to read this. But if I wanted to, I could. I, I do recommend you read everything, but I've gotten it already. Point of view is not addressed anywhere in this um, in these things. Maybe a blog is a point of view, but A is out. Identifying literary devices. Literary devices are things like simile, hyperbole, onomatopoeia, you know, those things used in fiction writing and in nonfiction writing. But that has nothing to do with what we have listed up here in this checklist. So that's out. Determining source reliability check. Yes. Determining text structure. Text structure is whether it is opinionated, expository, um, narrative, that type of thing is not really addressed here. Let's just have a look here. Who authored the piece and what are their credentials? Credentials further bringing me to reliability. All right. And I don't even need to read the rest of it. I'm good. All right. Let me just get that out of there. Okay. Let's have a look at number 15, answer choices first. The ability to adapt communication about audience, task, purpose, and discipline. All right, when you get to the writing portion of this exam, audience, task, and purpose are good words. We are trying to show students when they get to the writing part. So we start off with um, phonological and phonemic awareness, sounds only in words. Then we move to phonics, which is decoding words. Then we move to fluency, which is reading strings of words, sentences, paragraphs, things like that. Then we get to vocabulary, understand meaning in words. Then we get to comprehension, where we're actually reading and understanding, asking questions, predicting, higher order thinking skills within reading, comprehension. Then we get to writing. And writing is very important to communicate. And in order to do that effectively, we have to keep in mind who are we writing to the audience that's going to determine the text structure. Am I writing to the school board or am I writing to my grandmother? If I'm writing to my grandmother, I'm going to use a narrative. If I'm writing to the school board, I'm using expository or argumentative. If you're trying to plead your case task, why am I writing purpose? What is the purpose? What am I trying to achieve? And discipline, perhaps, is, is it a science text? Is it a, 
social studies uh, point of view, whatever. Let's look at B, the ability to use transition words. Okay, transition words is a good thing on this as well. And variance and flow is, are also good words on this. So A and B are looking good. We want sentence variety. We want our stuff to flow. We want to teach students how not to be so robotic in their um, written expression. So B is good as well. C, the ability to use proper grammar and punctuation. Now, those of you who have seen my videos, you know I love proper grammar. However, it is not the most important thing when we're teaching students to write and read. I think it's very important. Some of you probably think it's very important, but it is not the focus. So proper grammar, typically, unless you're in the grammar section, is not the right answer. D, ability to organize paragraphs so the writing has continuity. All right, continuity is also a good word. We need to show students how to make it flow properly. So A, B, and D are all good. C, I'm going to eliminate. Let's check the question. Which of the following is most important for students to consider when writing? It's audience task and purpose. The reason why is you can't start the writing process without that. Later, transition words and variance and flow is important. Later, making sure your paragraphs are organized. But the initial thing to consider is who are you writing to, why, what is the purpose, and what discipline is it coming from? That's going to help you be a better writer. All right, let me stop here real quick, take some questions. Just going to stop sharing here. All right, let me just see. Um, uh, Jane, I have a good words list. So somebody's asking me, can you write those words in the chat, please? It would take me all morning to write those words in the chat. On, in my study guide, I have a good words um, re reference page. It has all the good words that you should consider, and it has all the bad words you should leave out. Okay. Um, how do you study for this exam? That's a difficult question. Um, here's what I recommend you do. Let's say you get the study guide. So let's just do the study guide first. Okay. So you bought the study guide, you have it. And what I would do is I would read the first section. So the first content category, which is phonological and phonemic awareness. Okay. So I'd read that section really, really good. And I would take the mini little practice test at the end, the 10 questions at the end of that section. All right. Then I would see if the, um, if the, what I got wrong and I would really look at what I got wrong. And then I would go back into that section and zero in on those skills that I got wrong and just refresh them. Okay. Then I'd go to section two and then I would read all of that and do the, um, the, the, those sections questions, do the same thing for all five sections. Then when I'm done with that, I would do the full length practice test to see how I did. Then I would take all of that information and see where I'm low. I'm going to read all of the answer explanations because even when I get it right, I want to know why, because I could have guessed and gotten lucky. So I want to read all the answer explanations. And then I, then I want to zero in on that first practice test and see where, where am I low, go back into the book and in the table, let me show you real quick. Let me do this. Let me do this with uh, actual stuff. Okay. Let me show you how to do this with the actual book in front of you. This will help those of you who need this. Okay, here we go. Step one, I'm going to start with phonological and phonemic awareness. I'm going to read all of this information. Okay. I'm going to get to know it. I'm going to write notes. I'm going to do flashcards. However it is you learn. I might have the audio course as well. I'm going to listen to the audio course. I might have the video course as well. I might watch all the videos in the video course. Okay. Then I'm going to do these 10 questions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. I'm going to check my answers and where I'm low, I'm going to go, Oh, you know, I missed these three here. What are those? Oh, onset and rhyme segmenting. Oh, this has all to do with phonological awareness. Let me go back up to phonological awareness. Let me get in here and really look at the phonological awareness stuff. Let me really look at the difference between phonemic and phonological awareness. Let me review onset and rhyme and blends and all of that. Let me go through here with the continuum and the, and the linear, linear process of reading. Okay. And then I'm like, okay, I got it now. Now what I'm going to do is go to the next section. Here I am in phonics and decoding. I'm going to read everything in here, paying attention to these um, charts, paying attention to some of these practice. We have practice test questions all in here. Recursive phonics instruction, looking at it all, blah, blah, blah. Then I'm going to go to my questions. 
and I'm going to do all 10 of these questions. And I'm going to read these very important answer explanations here because there's even more information here. And I'm going to go, you know what? I only missed two here. Let me have a look. Oh, you know what? The CVC and the CVC words. I, I didn't understand that. Let me go back and let me find that chart. Where is that chart? I think it's here. I'm going to need to go back and review consonant vowel patterns. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I got that. Now I'm going to go to section three and on and on it goes. Now I did all that and we still have to do the constructed response. So bear with me guys. I'm just showing people how to study the actual multiple choice. Now, sorry. Let me go. Oh, I'm also going to study my good words list. Here's my good words list in my book. I'm going to look at all of this information here and I'm going to study my bad words to stay away from bad words. Okay. And then I'm going to take practice test one. And when I do that, I'm going to go through reading my answer choices first, looking in for good words, stuff like that, that I'm going to check and notice I have categories where each question is from. This is from the first one. Uh, here's all the ones for content category two. Here are all the questions for content category three. So I'm going to go in, check my answers. You know what? I was really low in content category two, which is phonics. I missed five questions in phonics alone. I need to go back into phonics. So I go back into the study guide and look at the phonics section. Okay. Then I might retake this. Let's just say you didn't mark it all up or you got the digital guide and you want to reprint the practice test and do it again. That's okay. Do it again, see if you get them correct. Um, and then keep going back and checking. Then after I've gone back and studied, now I'm ready for my final practice test, practice test two. I'm gonna go through here, going through all of them, working through everything, checking my answers, reading all these answer explanations, and saying, you know what? I got 75% correct on this second practice test. If you get 75% correct, you are ready for the exam. Now, here is something to consider. You do not need a 75 on this test. You need a D on this test to pass. People get so upset. Oh, this test is a scam. And look, I don't think it's fair. It's overpriced and it's, it's not really showing you what kind of teacher you can be, but it is a standardized system and this is the system we're in. So that's just the way it goes. You need like a high F or a D on this exam to pass it. Y you do not need an A. So, if you get a 75, which is a solid C, you're in the passing zone. Now that does not include the constructed response. And we're going to do that in just a second, but on the multiple choice or the selected response, you need like a D, you need an overall D. Um, so please don't freak yourself out and go, Oh my God, I need an A on all the practice tests. You don't, but I recommend you try to score as high as you can. And every question you get wrong, read the answer explanation. And even if you get right, get it right, read the answer explanation. Madeline, is this similar to 5002? Yes. Any elementary reading and language arts exam is just like this. So I would definitely use this free webinar if you're doing 5002. We have a lot of stuff for the 5002. I have a study guide. I have extra practice tests. I have videos and all of that. Now, if you are someone who is asking, how do I study for this test using the online course? Because some of you are getting the online course. Let me just go over that and then we're gonna get into the, um, then we're gonna get into the constructed response. Give me one second, because people have questions about how to study. So I just wanna show how you would use the online course really quickly. Let me go to preview. Okay, let me share screen. Okay, so the online course looks like this. And when you start your course, uh, everything's going to be in the menu here on the side right here on the left. Now you're going to download the study guide and you're going to study the study guide. Like I told you to study it just now that that video I just did on how to use the study guide going by section by section. Okay. But at the end of each section, before you do the, uh, the little quiz, do the videos here, content category one overview where I talk about everything phonological and phonemic awareness for 40 minutes. I talk to you straight about that. You're going to be so sick of me. Then you can do the quiz. This is the same 10 question quiz in the test, but it's online. So if you want it simulated like this here, if you want it simulated like the exam, and I have very detailed answer explanations here as well. So those are the 10 questions at the end of the study guide. But then what I have after that is explanation videos, for all of those little quizzes. So I basically go through, let me mute that. 
I go through each of these questions and tell you why they're correct and why they're incorrect. All right. And I do that for every single content category. And then of course I have, um, the assessment and the, um, constructed response videos here. So I go through all the constructed responses here. All right. So that's how you would use the online course. All right. And then the audio course is just like, you're trying, if you're like me, you're going for a walk, you're throwing in your headphones and you're like, let me get some information. And I learn a lot. I'm an auditory learner. So I like to do that. All right. Um, all right. So here we go. Uh, used your book and online course and passed the 5002 in December. Awesome. 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 Derek, these resources have helped me pass all seven exams. Oh, nice, Derek. I'm so happy about that. The online course looks good. Thank you. We're really uh, beefing up our online courses. So we're, we're trying to make it good. All right. Let me, uh, let's move to constructed response. Those of you who are patient, I just, I get that question a lot about how do I study? And I like to tell people because, and I don't know what your skill level is. You may be brand new to teaching and have no idea what reading instruction is. In that case, I would recommend the online course because I kind of go through it and really, uh, I'm explicit, very explicit, and it goes really well with the with the study guide. Okay, um, all right. So let's go into one more thing. We're doing the constructed response. Now this can be tough for people. We're going to do two here. All right. Now very important. I just did a video on this. I have it on TikTok and I have it on YouTube. Remember, we're working backward, right? We start with the answer choices first. When you do the constructed response, and this goes for those of you doing the Texas exams as well, start with the task first. Please start here. Don't start up here. Now, you might have a scenario like this and then a piece of data. You might have a student writing sample. There could be all kinds of things happening here. And you're going to get lost in the scenario before you even understand what you're supposed to do. This is what I would tell my reading students. Set the purpose for reading. Set the purpose for writing by figuring out what your task is first. Remember that question, audience task purpose? It's part of the actual questions on the, this exam. We wanna do that here. Now, I made this a little shorter and you will see ones like this on the test. Some will be longer and some will have data sets and all of that, it's okay. Focus on the task. Don't get too caught up in the scenario. All right, so let's start with the ta task. It says, be sure to respond to both. We have to respond to both of these bullets. Use the information provided in the scenario to do the following. Here we go. Identify two strategies. Mr. Payton, oops, I did that last time. This is Mr. Simpson. This should say Mr. Simpson, sorry. Identify two strategies Mr. Simpson can use to increase students' comprehension skills. All right, I don't even have to read the scenario to figure out what comprehension skills we could be using, right? What do I have? Metacognition, comprehension, generating questions, predicting, summarizing, read aloud, think aloud. All of those are, are strategies I can use regardless of the scenario. They work for the whole class. They work for students who struggle. So when you study for this test, you will most likely have a comprehension question. Figure out some go-to strategies that you can write to for comprehension. For me, read aloud, think aloud, which increases metacognition. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And questioning strategies. You might be someone who likes, I like prediction strategies. Okay, prediction strategies. Maybe it's graphic organizers. Whatever it is, use that. So I'm going to write those down, right? I'm going to write, you know, uh, read aloud, think aloud, read aloud, think aloud, R-A-T-A, -A, um, questioning strategies. I'm just, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. This is my scratch paper. I'm just organizing my essay here. All right. And then provide a rationale. All that means is why am I using this? What's good about it? Why am I using this? What's good about that? All right. There are two bullets. I can organize this one of two ways. I can make each strategy its own paragraph. So I'm going to have two paragraphs. So I could have strategy number one is paragraph number one, where I outline the strategy, give specifics, and provide the rationale. So I kind of combine the bullets there. And paragraph number two is strategy two with all the specific information along with the rationale. That's how I would do it. All right, let's read the scenario. It doesn't really matter because I already know what I'm going to do, but let's read the scenario. Mr. Simpson is a fourth grade reading teacher. As he and his students read through a text, Mr. Simpson notices many of his students struggle to comprehend the text 
main idea and key details. Okay, so I'm, I might want to use these words in my response. We want to use information from the scenario. Based on previous assessment, so he's been monitoring his students' progress, Mr. Simpson knows his students have a solid grasp of phonics and vocabulary skills. All right, so they've got the prereqs but they're still struggling with comprehension, which tells me they're struggling with the higher order skills. They got phonics, they have vocabulary, we've got to fix the comprehension. And I know what I'm going to do. Read aloud, think aloud for metacognition, and I'm going to use some questioning strategies. Here's how I would set it up. Two paragraphs, and I'm not going to do an intro, and I'm not going to do a conclusion. I'm going right in and telling the, the grader what I'm doing. I'm not going to make them hunt. I'm going to keep it simple. And the other thing I'm going to do is give specific examples. Let me, let me zoom in a little bit here. Um, can you see that? Let me, I just, I don't want to uh, push it out of screen here, um, but I want to make sure you can see it because it is very text heavy. So I apologize for that. All right. So we've got here the first strategy Mr. Payton can use, or it should be Mr. Simpson. Sorry about that. Um, the first strategy Mr. Payton can use to help students to comprehend text is read aloud, think aloud. Notice I tell the person the first strategy I'm telling the reader of my essay, here's strategy one, and it's read aloud, think aloud to increase metacognition. Now that's a general statement. Let's move forward and give you some specifics. He and his students can read the text aloud together. So now I'm explaining it. Then Mr. Payton can model, remember those good words, model his thinking process aloud to students. For example, now I'm getting more specific. When reading aloud, Mr. Payton can model how he summarizes, predicts, and processes the story. I get even more specific. He can say, that is interesting. I wonder why the main character acted like that. Perhaps it will be answered later in the story. He can also think aloud when he gets to difficult parts of the text. Read aloud, think aloud, here comes my rationale, is one of the most effective ways to increase metacognition, which is an essential skill for comprehension. So what did I do here? I told you right off the bat, strategy number one, which was my first bullet, is read aloud, think aloud. Why? Because of metacognition. What is metacognition? Metacognition is thinking about our thinking teaching students how to figure things out, not just saying, oh, use your spelling skills. No, I'm going to think aloud. Wow, that looks like a tough word. How, let me read around the word. Can I read around the word and figure it out? Can I use a picture? Can I use a graph? Let me skip down to this part of the paragraph. Let me see if that helps answer questions. You're talking it out with your kids. You're modeling. The term model is a good word. Metacognition, good word. Um, uh, reading comprehension, good word, predicting, summarizing, all of that, good words when it comes to comprehension. So there's my paragraph number one. You could even reduce this to just a few sentences. I have a lot here because I want you to see everything. All right, here comes strategy two, paragraph two. The next strategy Mr. Payton can use to help students comprehend text is question generation. And we saw this on the multiple choice and you saw it in my map of when I was reading this question generation is going to help with comprehension. This will help with high school students too. If you get a high school scenario for the 5206, or if you're taking another reading exam, that's K-12 helping students generate questions through college. I mean, today I have to help students generate questions. It's just a good skill to have. Mr. Payton can use, and I get even more specific, a KWL chart. This is a graphic organizer to organize their questions. Now I get specific. For example, students can fill out the K for what do they already know about the topic. This will help activate background knowledge. Another good word on the exam. And schema, which is key to understanding text. Next, they can fill out the W, which is what do we want to know. This will help students generate questions. Good word on the exam. Finally, after they are done reading, they can answer the L part of the, uh, the chart. What did we learn? Now, here's my rationale. This will help them summarize the text and reflect on important information they acquired while reading. Done. All right. So that's how we, sorry, that's how we do that. So I have strategy one, strategy two, 
I have, I have, ex have an explanation of the strategy. I have some specifics. I have words like for example in there, which tell the reader of my essay, I'm about to give you some specifics. Specifics are important when trying to get all your um, points. And then I give a rationale. I cover all my bases. All right. Let's try a high school example for those of you taking the 5206, but this will help with elementary as well um, because upper elementary does this as well. Okay. So here we go. Starting with the task, describe three strategies Ms. Jackson can use with her students to help them conduct scholarly research. Identify two research methods to help students cite sources properly and avoid plagiarism. So this I'm going to organize into two paragraphs, but this time paragraph one is going to satisfy this first bullet. Paragraph two is going to satisfy this second bullet. Now we're talking about research here. So right away, before I even read the scenario, let's get thinking. How can we help them conduct scholarly searches? Well, I can do explicit instruction and show them where to get scholarly searches. I can show them reliable sources online. I can show them unreliable sources online. I can show them uh, scholarly uh, websites. I can show them the .gov, .net, .edu um, distinction. Distinction. I can show them databases where they can get studies. All right, so there's one. Um, another thing I could do is model how to access that information. So not only tell them, but model. And then I might have them conduct that research on their own on the computers and be there to support. Two research methods to, to help avoid uh, plagiarism, citation properly. So we could talk about different um, citation methods, APA formatting, MLA formatting, and avoiding plagiarism. I would like to show my students plagiarism checkers. I used to be an English teacher. I showed students, hey, listen, uh, you turn in a paper to me, I'm sending it right through, you can just send it into Google and it'll tell you, but I'm sending it to turnitin.com. So here's how you access turnitin.com. And I highly recommend you dump your own stuff into turnitin.com so you're not even remotely plagiarizing or copying from the internet. And then we have to show them how not to copy because it's hard not to copy nowadays. You know, it's, it's not like when we were kids and we went to the card catalog and got our book out and summarized on a note card. I mean, everything's on the computer. Everything's chat GPT. So we have to show them the new way to do research. All right. So this is how I would set. All right. Let's read the question. Sorry. Or the scenario. Ms. Jackson is a ninth grade social studies teacher helping students with a research project on the New Deal. During the research process, Ms. Jackson has students use a variety of print and electronic resources to find information. In addition, Ms. Jackson will have students present their research to the class. So we need three strategies on how to conduct scholarly research and we need two research methods. All right. Let's have a look. Okay. Sorry for all the text on the page. Here we go. Oops. Here we go. I've got my first strategy is modeling the research pro process, focusing on credibility. That's what I said when I was explaining it to you. You guys are sitting down looking at me and I'm showing you, here's how you find scholarly resources that are credible and relevant. She can use explicit instruction, good words. Remember, I'm using all those good words in my writing to show st students how to discern scholarly sources from those uh, less credible. Um, and she can do this by evaluating resources. Here we go. Strategy number two. Another strategy she can use is to show students how to use research journals. She can show students how to access journals like, and here we go, specific, EBSCOhost, ProQuest, and other scholarly sources. And here we go. Lastly, so here's my third one. Ms. Jackson can introduce the concept of synthesis, teaching students how to integrate information from multiple sources to construct a co cohesive understanding. Um, and then she can show stu uh, she can show students how to move beyond mere data collection and move more toward engaging with the information. That last sentence is just fluff. You don't even need it. I just put it there. We're going from mere like um, concrete stuff to more sophisticated, higher order thinking skills. All right. So there's my three strategies for conducting scholarly research in one paragraph. Now the next paragraph. Now I need to make sure that there's academic integrity, that they're not copying. To ensure academic integrity of the research, Ms. Jackson must introduce two key research methods. And then I put a colon and I list them, proper citation and plagiarism checkers. 
Here we go. Teaching students the mechanics of citation styles, such as MLA or APA, provides a framework for crediting the original authors. So I don't just say citation software. I use specific words like MLA and APA and how important that is for crediting authors. And then I uh, go on a little bit more just to give you more rationale. Understanding how to correctly cite sources not only helps avoid plagiarism, but also aids in establishing a scholarly voice. You don't need that. I just put it in there. Next one. Furthermore, incorporating plagiarism checkers as a regular step in the research process and uh, as both a deterrent and an educational tool. It allows students to self-check their work for in unintended plagiarism. Like they might not even be trying to copy. They don't know. Some of them are, some of them are devious. I'll give you that. But a lot of them just don't know. They haven't been taught. Reinforcing the importance of originality and ethical use of information. These methods are critical in any research-based project ensuring students can build intellectual blah, blah, blah. All right, two there. Okay. All right. So let me go back here stop sharing all right so that concludes it you're going to get those two um constructed responses in the email um when you get the email from us okay so let me answer some questions um do you have an online course for 5024 i do not that's the um early childhood i do have one for 5025 we're working on 5024 we don't we're not there yet how do you decipher which assessment to use for the constructed response okay deirdre i i, I cover assessments very extensively in the online course the audio course and the book there are tons of different assessments there's formal there's informal um there's uh summative formative there's criterion reference there's performance based i go through all of that what you want to do when it comes to assessments is choose two or three that you can really understand and write to for me i like to use formative assessments because those are informal assessments that we use as teachers to kind of check our students work and stuff like that and then I also use like summative assessments at the end to see if my instruction worked. Now I go through this more in depth in the online course and in the book and all of that, but you want to grab two or three that you can really write to. Don't try to use one that you don't know too much about. You can apply formative and summative to any test question. That's what I would do there. Um, I think the hardest part is going to be with some, so many strategies in our study book to remember. That's why I say grab two or three. Here's what you need to do. There are five skill sections of the book phonological and phonemic awareness find a couple strategies there maybe it's um phony manipulation strategies maybe it's deletion strategies find two strategies for phonemic awareness and phonological awareness in the book find two phonics strategies find two vocabulary strategies find two uh fluency strategies find two comprehension and two writing that way, no matter which one you're asked, you can pull from those two strategies and write to it. Don't try to get it all. Grab two from each section that you really understand and get, and you'll be able to use those to write to. Can we go back and watch this again? Yes, you will get the recording in the email. Don't worry about that. Everything is recorded. Everybody can watch it. Um, all right. We will pass. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Can we go back and watch this again? Yep. Can we go back and watch this again? Yes. <laughs> um, thank you, Kathleen, for all you do. What is your recommendation for how much daily study we can do and not get overwhelmed? A very good question, Lee. Do not spend four hours a day on this. I recommend 20 to 30 minutes a day. I told you how to break up that, um, study guide, read one section and do the questions and then put it down and go for a walk. I don't like cramming. I'm better at incremental practice over time. Some people are crammers, and if that's your way, do it, fine. But if you're struggling and you're brand new and you really wanna learn this information, take it one step at a time. I would take it one section a day, and if you have the online course, I might take two or three days because you're gonna read the book, you're gonna watch the video, you're gonna listen to the audio. I would take it one step at a time, okay? Um. Are these strategies in your book? Yes. Everything I talk about today is in the book, the online course, and the audio course. Um, is there a math one too? I have math for 5003, Praxis Core Math, and 5164. You can search that on our website. All right. Carolyn feels better about the test. Awesome. I'm so glad. All right. Let me show you where to get more 
free stuff. Give me one more second and then I'm going to let you go. I know we went over a little bit, but um, of course, we've got my website here, okay? We've got the online course, the 5205. We've got the um, the study guides and the uh, audio course, all right? You might be like, I want the audio course and the online course. Don't get the study guide then because the study guide comes with the online course. See? Oops. Stop sharing. Sorry. I hit the wrong button. Remember, this course has the study guide. Don't buy both when you buy the online course. But you might want the audio and the study guide. Mix and match. Do what you want. And there's also an offer code in the email and in the chat. So do that. Um, let's go to... So everything you need is on the website. Also, free webinars. Somebody was asking about the... Um, the 5002, I have this, elementary education. I've got um, leadership here, ESOL, PLT. Um, I've got some other webinars for lesson planning and um, uh, starting the school year off with success. This is classroom management. So go to my webinars page and check those out. They're all recorded. All you have to do is fill out the form and it'll take you there, okay? The next resource I have is my YouTube channel. So many videos here. I highly recommend the test strategy. You can see here, think like a test maker and work backwards and teaching reading. These are all really important. So, um, and then the writing, I have a lot of constructed response stuff here. If you're working on that, then I have all my live subject area sessions. These are the webinars. Okay. Um, let me think. And then of course I got PLT. I've got all kinds of things. Math. I have a math playlist. Somebody was asking for math. Oh my God. Look at that thumbnail. I hate it when they catch me in a weird face. Okay. Then I have TikTok, loving TikTok, really having a lot of fun with it, much shorter videos. If you like shorter stuff, you can always go to the link in my bio on TikTok. It'll take you to my, my stuff. I do everything from quick algebra to test prep to using ru rubrics, different things, all kinds of things here. Check me out on TikTok. Love it. And then of course, um, uh, Facebook, all that. LinkedIn, although LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn right now, but I don't love LinkedIn. Um, will this help with the 5010203 Teresa, this is for the teaching reading. It'll help you with the 5002, but you need 5003, 04, and 05. That's social studies, science. That's different than this. That's a different exam. So go to my webinars page and I have a whole webinar for that particular exam. Um, all right. What do you, what, uh, do you have information on ESE? ESE is special ed. I'm doing a special education webinar next week. So if you need special education, come see me next week. I also have a lot of um, videos on special education on my YouTube channel and on my website. All right. So don't forget to check your email. You're going to get all the information I talked about here today, along with some links that I talked about today. Um, also, you're going to get an offer code check out my paid resources if you want, or check out more free resources on the website and on my YouTube channel. All right. So I am so glad you guys joined me here today. We ran a little bit over. Thank you for your patience. We covered a lot. And um, let me know if you have any questions, you can email us at info at KathleenJasper.com. Remember, if you bought the book and you want the online course, the audio course is separate. If you want the online course, email us your Amazon uh, receipt with your name visible so we know it's you, and we will apply that to the price of the course. Also, if you bought it from us, let's say you bought the digital book, we can look you up. So just say, I bought it from your website, okay? Do you have any other webinars? Yes, on the webinars tab on my website, I have tons of webinars. I do them every Saturday, except the last Saturday of the month, all right? All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, I am signing off now. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining me and good luck on